Um, so uh, I'm just going to give the introduction to the introduction. So um, we're, I'm really excited that we're starting this series now in science, and it's a pilot, but hopefully I can see from the turnout that we have a good audience. So that's exciting, and this is one of those things that came about sort of by accident. Joe O'Neill was the, I don't see Joe, but I assume he's here somewhere. Oh, there he is. Was uh, the unfortunate acting chemistry head for a year, and that gave him and I many chances to have discussions about many things, including uh, pedagogy. And then he would come back from various meetings he had been at and describe some exciting talks he had heard about pedagogy with ideas and whatnot. And so finally, he and I had the brilliant idea, you would think we were rocket scientists or something, that we could bring some of those speakers here and uh, talk to us all collectively. And then Joe uh, volunteered to take on the organization for which we're very excited and you've got some group together and here's the, today we have the uh, first output from that effort. So uh, I'm gonna let Juliet uh, introduce the speaker and uh, hopefully this will be good, thank you. I have to read, so I apologize for that, but our speaker, uh, Natasha Holmes, is a, currently a postdoctoral researcher in the physics department at Stanford. She received her uh, Bachelor of Science in Physics from Guelph and her PhD from uh, the University of British Columbia. She is a physics education researcher, so that's her research, uh, and she primarily studies teaching and learning in lab courses. At UBC, she developed and evaluated a pedagogical framework for teaching and learning in physics lab courses that focuses on developing critical thinking skills through the iterative and reflective nature of experimentation. Currently, she's working to evaluate the mechanisms of this pedagogy to adapt that framework to other lab courses and contexts and to develop more efficient and objective ways to measure learning in lab courses. In January, she will begin a faculty position in the physics department at Cornell University as a physics education research faculty. And today, she's here to tell us about assessing critical thinking in intro physics labs. Hey, thank you very much for having me. Um, so before we get started, if anyone is sitting alone, you're gonna wanna find a friend to sit next to. So we will take five seconds for you to rejuggle your seating choices if you would, if you're sitting alone. <laughs> A little preview for what's to come. <laughs> okay, uh, so thank you for the introduction. Um, so I'm thrilled to be here to talk about the research that we've been doing. Um, mostly I'm gonna talk about intro labs. Um, so the outline for what we're gonna go through, I'm gonna do it quick since this is the first one of these talks, a little intro to what is physics education research um, in this world. Um, and then I'm gonna dig into my work um, that's been happening in lab courses specifically. Um, okay, so uh, the, the approach that we take to physics education research, uh, so I'm currently at Stanford working with Carl Wyman um, and I came from UBC, a program that was sort of initially developed by Carl Wyman, so that's sort of where my world comes from. So my view is this notion of taking a scientific approach to science education, borrowing from Carl Lyman um, in an article he wrote a couple of years ago. And so what does that actually look like? So at the University of British Columbia and the University of Colorado Boulder, there are science education initiatives that have been looking at teaching and learning in um, science departments. And they take what they call a three-pronged approach to developing and evaluating um, their courses. So it looks something like this, and we're basically the idea is that we're asking questions, um, what should students be learning, and sort of who gets to decide that? Um, what are students learning, and how do we know what students are learning? And then what instructional approaches are actually going to improve student learning? So if we try to take this scientific approach to these ideas, we can kind of translate these questions. Um, so if it, for example, what should students be learning is really what are we trying to measure? Um, what are students learning is how are we going to actually measure that? <laughs> and then uh, the instructional approach is sort of what variables are we changing and testing in our experiments? So let's go to an example. Uh, so I'm gonna pull an example from the University of British Columbia. Um, this was work that Carl Wyman did with researchers there. Um, they were asking questions, okay, what should students be learning? They were working in a, a first year introductory electricity and magnetism course. So they thought students should be learning. Uh, conceptual understanding of electricity and magnetism, um, and they used a set of 
objective learning goals that were written by the instructors in a, this first year course. How are they going to measure it? Uh, they decided to use student scores on a conceptual physics test. And this is a very quick explanation of this study. So obviously there's a lot more details. Um, what variables are they going to change? So two different instructional approaches. So the first approach that they tried was what they called a conventional lecture. So like what I'm doing to you right now, I'm talking and you're all just kind of passively listening to me. Um, and they compared this to what they called scientific teaching. The notion that an instructor is actually coaching, walking around the room, listening in on student conversations, eventually leading a follow-up discussion. But ultimately, the idea is that the students are practicing, they're active, they're solving tasks. Um, they're not just sitting and listening um, to the instructor. So let's start practicing our scientific teaching. Um, so we're comparing these two groups on their measure of conceptual understanding. We're teaching in these two different ways um, for only a week. So what's sort of your um, prediction? How different do you expect the scores on this test to be between these two groups after only a week's worth of instruction? Do you think it's, uh, there's gonna be sort of no difference? Do you think there will be less than a one sigma or one standard deviation difference? Somewhere around two sigma or something greater than a two sigma difference? And so hold up your fingers for me, give me a one, two, three, or four, depending on what your prediction is. Okay, do you wanna have a quick conversation, turn to your neighbor and talk about this? Okay, I am conscious of the time, so I'm gonna cut you off nice and early. Uh, any quick, or actually let's do a revote. Uh, give me a one, two, three, or four revote on what you think the difference is gonna be. This is wonderful. I should have had you look around the room. Everyone started with different ideas, and now I've got pairs of numbers all around the room. This is wonderful. Pure instruction in, in action. Okay, let's look at the data. Um, so this is what our control group scored. So the control group was getting about 41% on this um, conceptual physics test. Um, mean is about 13, or the standard deviation is about 13%. And our experimental scientific teaching group are up here at 74. The two and a half sigma difference actually ends up being sort of tripling the student learning. Um, and that's a huge, big change after only a week of instruction. That's pretty cool, pretty cool. Okay. Um, the other piece of this, so we've done this sort of three steps, right? What are students learning? Um, uh, what should they be learning? And then what's happening? Uh, at the heart of this is really, okay, but why? We're scientists, it's not just about saying, when I do this, this happens, but why does that happen? Um, and that's sort of a whole other um, talk, unfortunately, that I'm not gonna go into. Um, I will just take a, a quick quote to sort of explain some of the stuff that's behind this idea of active learning. Um, uh, the quote is, uh, learning results from what the student does and thinks and only from what the student does and thinks. The teacher can advance learning only by influencing what the student does to learn. And so the idea of these active classrooms is that the students are actively participating in their learning in this space um, and the instructor gets to sort of guide that process. Um, and that's just a very small glimpse into a very complicated <laughs> um, field of learning. Uh, and I only take a small glimpse because that's not really where my expertise is. My expertise is in lab courses, so we're gonna dive into labs. So how does this three-pronged approach apply to the world of labs? The first thing we need to talk about is what are we trying to measure? What should students be learning in lab courses? So um, what we're gonna do is a think, pair, share on this one. Uh, I want you to take five seconds just to think to yourself what the intro um, or what the goal of intro science labs are, and you can replace physics with whatever your discipline is. Um, and then have a quick conversation with your neighbor about what you think the goals are. So we'll give you 10 seconds to think on your own, 30 seconds to talk to your neighbor, and then I'm cutting you off again. <laughs> 
Okay. I'm sure you're all having wonderfully fruitful discussions, and once again, I'm, I'm sad to cut them off. Um, for the, to discuss with the group, I'm going to start to kind of guide your thinking a little bit in my direction. Um, <laughs> Too much manipulation. <laughs> I'm, in control, I'm in control here. You can't. Anyway. Um, so what I want you to do is think about, so these are um, some ideas of possible uh, goals. So the idea of understanding or reinforcing scientific concepts, um, developing interest and motivation, developing scientific practical skills and problem solving abilities, um, scientific habits of mind, or an understanding of the nature of science. So based on the discussion you had uh, right now, give me a one, two, three, four, or five for the, um, where the goals that you were talking about, where most of them fall in this spectrum. Uh, what you think is the most important or best captures what you were talking about. I'm still waiting on more hands. I want to see everyone's hands in the back. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, so if you look around the room, I'm not making this anonymous, um, you'll see uh, an important feature of this is that there's not really consensus. Everyone has their own ideas. I see a couple people holding up two hands, which suggests that they can't even decide what it is, um, which is sort of the message that I want to I wanna get across here. Um, so uh, these two authors did two uh, meta-analyses of science education research, looking at what the goals of science labs were. And there was no consensus in the research. There's no consensus in this room. There's kind of no consensus. Um, and labs, unfortunately, are also trying to, often trying to do all of this, if not more, um, which, which becomes sort of overwhelming. Um, and the worst part of this story, or the most problematic part of the story, is that uh, there hasn't actually been much published research on the effectiveness of different lab curricula at doing any of these things. And so we don't have consensus, we don't have any evidence to help guide our consensus, so uh, what are we doing? This sounds like a problem to some people. It sounds like a wonderful opportunity to a physics education researcher like me. So I now have a playground of places um, to start doing experiments. Um, so let's start talking about some of the data that has been coming out in the last little while. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about the idea of um, science lab courses as reinforcing scientific understanding um, of science content. Yes? For now, we'll talk first year. Yeah, for now, we'll talk first year. But I agree, um, once we get into upper courses, it becomes a little bit hazier. Yeah. Um, OK, so um, let's go back to our, our triangle. Let's say the thing we want to we learn um, is scientific concepts and the course content, reinforcing the ideas in the class. Um, and so the idea of, you know, if we're trying to reinforce the ideas in the class, we should be able to use the course exam as a measure of the effectiveness. Um, and then instructional approaches. Um, we took advantage of an opportunity at an institution where the lab course was optional, so we could literally compare students who were taking the lab versus those who were not taking the lab. Um, so this is a summary of what I just said. We're comparing students who take the lab to don't on learning the physics content from lecture using the um, final exam. Um, but if you're paying attention, the idea of an optional lab course where some students are going to take the lab but they don't have to, clearly the students who opt to take the lab are not going to be equivalent to the students who don't opt to take the lab. So we have to deal with these sort of selection effects. We've got a systematic in our measurement, right? To science that. Uh, get back to our science analogies. Um, OK, so what do we do with this? So we um, came up with a, a neat way of looking at this. So the idea that on an exam, you're covering a whole bunch of different science ideas. We only have so many labs, so not all of the um, science questions are covered by a lab. And so we can actually take a ratio of students' scores on the lab-related questions to the scores on the non-lab-related questions, the idea being um, that the lab should help these questions and not these ones, right? Um, and so we can test a hypothesis that the students who take the lab, should this ratio should be higher than this ratio, which also sort of takes into account just the inherent difficulty um, levels of the different questions, right? Um, OK, cool. So when we look at the data across, we did this with two different courses, uh, and we're working on a couple of replication studies currently. This is what we have. So we've got two different physics courses, lab students, the non-lab students, 
and this is that ratio, and consistently we're seeing no measurable effect um, on student learning of the lecture content by this measure. And now that's not to say that the students aren't learning anything. Um, it's saying that the goal of these labs was to reinforce the lecture content, and it is not making a measurable impact on that, which gives us back to our title, we need to rethink these labs. And so that asks, leaves us with the question, well, well then what should students be learning? And I'm gonna make a little bit of a leap here um, and talk a little bit broader about what labs can be good for and sort of my view on them. Um, that labs offer unique opportunities to develop experimentation practices and scientific skills. And this has been supported by the um, American Association of Physics Teachers, submitted a, or released a recommendation for the undergraduate physics lab curriculum that is primarily reinforcing skills and practices. Um, in the United States, the next generation science standards at the K-12 level um, is putting greater emphasis on um, skills and scientific abilities. And this wonderful gem of a paper uh, that came out in the Canadian Journal of Physics in, uh, just this year, uh, researchers at York did a cross-sectional survey of Canadian physics students, and your physics students are saying that they want more skills um, and re uh, uh, practices um, developed rather than content. Okay. So this brings me back to the title, this notion of teaching and assessing critical thinking, and what is it that I actually mean by critical thinking, and why is this the thing to be doing? Um, so this is how I define critical thinking, the processes through which you decide what to believe. Uh, and I'm not gonna get into a religious or political debate, um, and so we attach this quantitative term at the front, um, because we're really talking about those processes related to data and models and all of the inherent uncertainty and variability that goes into those processes. Um, so why do I think we should teach this stuff? Um, I could probably spend an entire hour just motivating this on a soapbox, but I'm not gonna do that. Uh, boil it down to two ideas. Critical thinking is something that uh, is a fundamental skill that any scientist and arguably any voting citizen should possess, uh, and it will intrinsically relate to learning other scientific skills and practices, and that will become a little bit more apparent as we move through the talk. Okay. So this is uh, our sort of model of what critical thinking looks like, at least in an intro physics course. Um, the idea is that students are gonna make a comparison, they're gonna collect information and make some sort of comparison, whatever that might be, and we'll talk about what that is. Uh, reflect and interpret that comparison, and then decide how to act on it, what to do with this information. The idea of a comparison being that you're putting things in context. And so, um, Ultimately, what uh, I'm gonna talk about for the rest of this talk are these two corners of, okay, what are students learning and how do we measure it, and what are these different instructional approaches that are gonna teach it. Okay, so this is what we've already covered. We're moving into this realm now, um, so let's charge forward. So um, at the heart of this sort of three-step process is this notion of comparison, so let's talk a little bit about what that might look like. So in an intro physics lab, one of the things that we do um, is this notion of uh, a measurement with its error bars, and we ask students, do these measurements agree? Um, so I could ask you to think about this question, but what I want you to think about, again, I'm leading you along my, my train of thought, uh, what's wrong with this question? So again, I want you to turn to your neighbor and have a quick conversation about this very leading question I've posed to you. What's wrong with this question? Do these measurements agree? think? What sort of things have come out of your discussion? What's wrong with this question? Yeah? I don't think, shouldn't we know what's on the x-axis over here? Sorry, the x-axis is meaningless. It's just spatial. I needed to move those so that they weren't sitting on top of each other. What does agree mean? 
Pardon? What does agree mean? Beautiful. What does agree mean? What does agree mean? Why do we ask that? What else? Yeah? Agree. Absolutely. <laughs> Wonderful. Yes, this notion of a degree of agreement. Did you have something else, Ruth? Uh, yeah, it, it implies that we want the two values. Oh, I like that. Science. I like that also. If you're actually doing research, you're often looking for difference because you want to say, my new theory is explain something different. Right, so this is actually kind of a confirmatory statement. Okay, one more and then I got to move on. <laughs> we need to find out what those measurements are first. What do you mean, what those measurements are? Oh, yeah. Sure. Right. Yes. Uh, and even more so, I didn't even tell you what the error bars were, <laughs> which is a whole other thing. Um, so all of these ideas are sort of leading to uh, what has been coined point versus set reasoning. The notion that these measurements are actually, these error bars are actually approximations for some sort of probability distribution, whatever that distribution might be associated with your measurement. Um, and uh, so this has been coined point reasoning, the notion that any single measurement could be the true value, and any deviation from the true value is an error, which is often interpreted as a mistake, um, as opposed to set reasoning, which is the notion that any single measurement is just an approximation of the physical quantity being measured, and deviation is going to be random according to some probability distribution. And my favorite issue with this question is, uh, do these measurements agree, is when students say, you know, if they overlap, they agree, if they don't overlap, they disagree, and if they're just touching here, then that must be the true value. <laughs> okay, so we've got work to do, right? So just this question, this way of representing our information is misleading students into a lot of very um, problematic lines of thinking. So the first thing we have to deal with is how can we get them making more sophisticated um, comparisons? And it's this notion of a degree of agreeness. Uh, and if we go back to this question that I asked you, we were talking about a one sigma difference, a two sigma difference, um, and that's sort of the thinking that we use, uh, so why aren't we doing that with our students? So uh, we've sort of operationalized this into something we call a T prime score, which just takes the difference between two measured values A and B, divided by their uncertainty, so this is telling us the one sigma, two sigma, three sigma difference between two measurements. Um, and the other type of comparison that we often do in physics is the notion of comparing um, data to a fit line, and so uh, once we get to least squares fitting with the weighted chi-squared, for example, structurally has the same form as this T prime, the idea of taking a difference between your data and the line in units of uncertainty. Now it's squared and averaged, but the sort of principles apply. And so beyond just improving how we're making comparisons, it's actually gonna help us with this reflection and acting on the comparisons piece. So in particular, if we think about interpreting these indices, if we get a small index in either case, that suggests possible agreement because the difference between the two measured values is smaller than the uncertainty, so this is our agree world. Um, however, we can actually look at this with our proportional reasoning and say, hey, if my denominator is large, I'm gonna get a small index. And so we can actually get into a situation where we motivate students, you should try to iterate to improve your measurement if you get a small index because, and try to reduce your uncertainty, because you might be hiding a subtle disagreement with poor precision. On the other side of the scale, if we get a large index, that's gonna suggest possible disagreement. Um, and if we were, because the difference between the two measured values is bigger than the uncertainty, and if we were assuming that these were, our hypothesis was that these were supposed to be the same, we can encourage students to iterate to improve their measurement, um, maybe checking for mistakes, systematics, um, or evaluating um, the model that they're using to uh, make these comparisons. If we're in the middle, we borrow from astrophysics, we say that we're in tension. Uh, so once again, we iterate to improve our measurement, uh, focusing on reducing uncertainty, um, specifically at this level. At the intro level in general, our students aren't gonna be quite as careful or proficient with the equipment as say, you experts are. Um, and uh, worse than that, we've also seen students retroactively inflate their uncertainties in order to get agreement. So we're trying to push them into a world of you can take high quality measurements in this lab space, I promise. Um, okay, and so the notion of this sort of critical thinking piece is using these comparisons, in this case very quantitative comparisons, um, to get students thinking about improving their design, um, improving and evaluating their experimental design, 
and even their uh, physical models. So let's uh, dig into an example of what this actually looks like in practice. I've been talking way up here. We need to get down here. So um, the first example, the first experiment that we do in our lab course is getting students to measure the period of a pendulum. We have them testing the period at an angle of amplitude of 10 degrees and 20 degrees, compare these two measurements, and then based on that comparison, iterate to improve their measurements. And now the equation right, that they've seen in class is this notion that the period doesn't depend on the angle of amplitude. OK. So this is just about as much instruction we give the students. So then we sort of hand them a stopwatch and a protractor and say, go, and a pendulum. Um, and they, get to, they have to sort of play around a little bit and make their own decisions about how they're going to actually measure this. So this group of students, for example, measured single periods, so just the time to go back and forth and stop. Um, they repeated this 10 times, calculated an average and then a standard error, and they get a T prime score at it, 0.18. Okay. So based on our decision table, uh, we're in the agreement stage, so they need to try to reduce their uncertainty. So we've told them, reduce your uncertainty. We haven't given them any structure beyond that, so they get to actually play around and design their own improvements. And we've seen everything from tape on the floor to better match the point where it crosses, um, to trying to block air resistance, to uh, don't let so-and-so time because he keeps miscounting. Um, whatever, it's up to them to figure out. And granted, that's probably an improvement, right? Um, so we, we leave it up to them. So there's a little bit of freedom here. Eventually, uh, you can. so this group of students figured out that if they press start, let it swing for 10 periods, and then press stop, your timing uncertainty is spread out over 10 periods instead of once every period. So their uncertainty goes down by a factor of 10. Now we're out at a T prime score of two. Um, and even though we only told them to iterate once, they're now in this tension reason, region and they just have to know what's going on. So they try to get their uncertainty down even more. Uh, so they go down by another factor of two. And now they're out at a T prime score of uh, 3.7. Okay. So now uh, what I'm going to show you is the conclusions that one of these students wrote in their um, lab notebook at the end of this lab period. So the student says, the opposite of the expected happened. T improved is greater than 3. The measured values are different. Conclusion. The period of a pendulum does depend on the angle with the vertical in the initial position. The algebraically derived formula, the period is approximately 2 pi root L over G of a pendulum, is only valid for small angles. Considering the results of this experiment, 20 degrees is obviously not small enough, since the angle has an effect on the period t and should be somehow represented in the formula. If you can make a precise enough measurement, you can show that the theoretical derivation of the equation of motion for a pendulum is just a good approximation and reality is slightly more complicated. That's what quantitative critical thinking looks like. <laughs> uh, and before someone asks, I will say this was a beautiful example. This was not an average example. <laughs> <laughs> um, which sort of leads us, well, um, what's next? Yeah, so I'm going to, um, this sort of, you know, it leads us to this question of, okay, but what do we do with a whole course? But before we move into that, um, I just want to talk a little bit about what, what happened in this. So um, this notion of connecting this approximation and this assumption with the precision of a measurement is turning this thing that otherwise is often just this thing that they're supposed to calculate at the end of the lab into something physical. And I think that that's the notion of critical thinking is really about making sense of the experiment and the data that you're getting. Um, and so the, some of the features that sort of go into this um, is this, this idea of having students revise and iterate and improve on their experiment and giving them the time and the freedom to do so as well as giving them the autonomy, the freedom to make decisions, which inevitably will lead to the autonomy to make mistakes. Um, but as an instructor, you're there providing feedback and support to help students learn from those decisions and learn from those mistakes. And that's sort of what this is all about. And again, you know, thinking again about the why all of this works, um, there's a whole bunch of literature that sort of suppo supports those ideas um, at improving learning. And again, that could be a whole other talk that I'm unfortunately not going to get into. OK, um, so I'll pause for a, a quick second. I think I have a little bit of time. So let's, does anyone have any quick comments before we move into the sort of does it work part of the talk? Yeah. Right. Yeah, so. Um, 
Right, and the, the data that I'm going to show you isn't going to quite answer that question, so I will answer that now. Um, the idea of, of revising and iterating um, is sort of what's at the heart of this, is that the whole notion of this is that students improve, and so wherever they start, they improve. And so um, you give the students this freedom, someone might start and they're going to take a terrible measurement, but you give them the time to improve on that measurement and then they get to move a step up. And so um, rather than leaving anyone at any individual place, this sort of structure allows wherever they are to begin with, they get to do their own thing. And so um, I think that's sort of the benefit of this model is rather than forcing them all to do the same thing, it ends up being a little bit more individualized. Um, yeah, and, and there's clearly a lot more research that actually needs to go into what that looks like, but um, as a TA in the course, that was sort of what I saw. Yeah, for you. Well, I want to ask about TAs, so for cool. uh, I'm going to answer that question very superficially, and then we'll talk more about it later. <laughs> um, so we, uh, this section, so the um, course that I'll describe had 48 students in a lab period at a time with two teaching assistants. Um, and so um, there's a lot more to it than that, though. And so we will save that for the end <laughs> if we have time. OK, um, so let's go in. So the, the important thing to think about here is, OK, I showed you this beautiful example of recognizing quantitative critical thinking. Um, and so we need to think about how do we actually know what students are learning. Um, okay, so this is work uh, that we did at the University of British Columbia, uh, where we were studying two cohorts of the same intro physics course, um, both of which were doing similar sets of experiments in the course, uh, and many of these experiments involved common measurement mistakes, systematic effects, or model issues like this pendulum one um, that would sort of give students surprising results that help sort of motivate the sort of revision um, and iteration. Um, there were about 140 students in each group, so there's a control group and an experimental group. Some of the key differences, so our um, control group, we're using that sort of more traditional just overlapping uncertainties way of comparing things, whereas the experimental group, we're using these T prime scores. Um, uh, both groups were doing fitting eventually with chi-squared, but we also taught the experimental group residual graphs because it's a beautiful way to actually visualize a chi-squared fit. Um, and then in terms of these sorts of instructions to iterate, the control group never got any of this. It was just, here's the lab, go and do it. Um, whereas the experimental group had uh, instructions to iterate in what we call faded scaffolding. So I'll go through what that actually looks like. Um, so this is sort of a timeline of our, uh, I guess, 19 weeks of experiments in this two semester course. And so we could give students um, instructions to make com specific comparisons and to iterate that would actually be in the lab manual, lab protocol. And then there would also be sort of reminders in the grading rubric. You know, you're gonna get scored for showing evidence of iterating. You're gonna get a point for making this comparison. And so the X's mean that we did it at that time, and then it sort of fades dynamically um, over the course. Um, and so uh, all I'm gonna talk about, so we've looked sort of across the semester. All I'm gonna talk about today are three experiments. The pendulum experiment that we just talked about happened way at the beginning of the course. Um, and then we have an RC circuit and an LR circuit experiment that happened at the end of the course. The RC circuit doesn't have any sort of model issue or anything. It kind of just comes out clean. Um, whereas the LR circuit has a fun little model issue that comes up. Um, and so you'll see sort of the um, instructions are pretty light here. And in fact, the instructions for the LR circuit experiment were identical to those given to the, the control group a year earlier. Okay, um, so one of the things we can look at, we're trying to get students to iterate on their measurements so we can go and look and see if they iterate, um, especially in these situations where we've stopped telling them to do it. And so we can look at whether students propose a way to change or improve their measurement and then whether they actually go and carry it out. Um, so in the pendulum, for example, the students were iterating um, by actually totally rechanging their experiment, letting it swing more times between each measurement. Um, the changes could be a lot more subtle than that. So in the LR circuit experiment, for example, one student wrote in their book, discussion of graph. The graph appears to be linear with the exception of the first 10 ohm point. We will retake this point and average them to be more certain in our measurements. This improved the linear nature of the graph. Okay, so this is sort of a low bar <laughs> change just to show you sort of how subtle these changes might be, but clearly showing evidence that this is happening a little bit more on the fly sort of as they're taking their data, which is great. Okay. Um, so uh, what I'm going to show you is going to be a, a graph of the fraction of students who either proposed something or also went ahead and carried it out. 
And so we'll have the fraction of students who engage in either of these behaviors up the y-axis and then those three experiments um, across um, this way. And so just to sort of think a little bit, where do you expect a control group of students who have never been told to revise and iterate their measurements, what fraction of them do you think would write in their lab notes um, either a proposal or a actually carrying out a change to their experiment? So more than 75%, somewhere between 50 and 75 percent, between 25 and 50, or below 25 percent. Let's do a one, two, three, four. Okay, I'm seeing lots of threes and fours. Okay, ready? Bam. That's it. Down here. <laughs> so less than 10 percent of students are actually engaging this when we don't tell them to. And that's consistent with lots of other literature that's um, found this in, in other courses. But sure enough, when we tell students to do something, they will do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> with a couple of students not getting the memo at the top, but otherwise, um, you know, they'll follow instructions pretty well. Um, so the real question is, okay, but what happens when we stop telling them to? And sure, it goes down, um, but we've still got huge gains over this control group, um, which is pretty cool. And so, um, okay, we can draw a conclusion, okay, they're doing it, we got them doing it. But it's sort of a question of, will they keep doing it? Is this just something that became an expectation in the course, or is this something that actually they decided to adopt and uh, take on? Um, so fortunately, I, we were able to look at students in a second year electronics lab course. So about 45 of our students each year in our intro course continue on in the second year electronics lab. Um, this is a completely different context. They're re submitting fi formal reports after two week long labs. Um, totally different TA instructor team. I can't, totally different. Um, and I, I looked at the week six LRC experiments, so they've been in the course for several weeks now, um, the following year after our course. So we can do the same sort of analysis of their formal lab reports now, as opposed to lab notebooks, and this is what we get. So 25% of students are still writing in their lab books the ways that they improved and iterated on their experiment in the formal lab report. Um, with a 25% on top of that making suggestions about how else they could do better. Um, again, big, con big gain over the control group, which is pretty cool. So clearly something has stuck. The other thing we looked at is this notion of evaluating models. Um, when students are improving their experiments, do they um, get to a point where they've identified an issue, a discrepancy, disagreement with the model? Um, and then do they try to explain that issue physically? Um, so the beautiful example of this in the pendulum, right, that we saw, in the LR circuit, an example is um, we used 1 over tau equals R over L plus B. And I should say they were testing the model that 1 over tau equaled R over L. So they found this extra intercept that they needed. Um, so where B is some constant to model our data points. Given that there is a B present at R equals 0, this means there is a 1 over tau constant at R equals 0. This means that there is an internal resistance within the circuit when R equals 0. So recognizing this is different from the model and trying to make physical sense of it. Um, and then just to highlight, you know, when we talked about those cycles, most of it was iterating to improve measurements. And the idea of revising models wasn't nearly as explicit in the structure that we gave them. But it really is something that comes for free when students are trusting their own experiments, trusting their data, and willing to sort of defy authority um, in these contexts. And so if we make a similar plot um, where yellow is just that they identified that something was wrong and blue is that they also went ahead and um, tried to explain it, a uh, fraction of students at the y-axis, and then just the pendulum in LR because RC was clean and pretty. Um, and so sure enough, because this wasn't explicit in our instruction, we don't really have big differences um, between the two groups in this case. But over time, as this becomes a little bit more routine, again, as they learn to um, trust their data over the authority and recognize the limitations and assumptions, uh, we've got students actually getting into this sort of critical thinking. Uh, and then even furthermore, we can go into the second, lab, second year lab course. This LRC experiment also had a model issue. They're looking at the transient response, and you get a sort of amplitude discrepancy. Um, and what was funny about this is that the instructions actually prompted students that the result might come out differently than expected and told them to think about why that might be. So this is literally like the yellow coding and the blue coding, right? Um, so they were actually told to do this. Uh, and we've still got a huge gain over our control group. Um, so clearly it is something that they had learned to do um, over the course of our instruction. Okay, 
And all of this just coming from these three steps of getting students to make comparisons, whatever those comparisons might be, to reflect on them, and then to do something about it, um, and working iteratively and reflectively. Okay. Uh, so in the last little bit of time that I have, I want to talk a little bit about this notion of um, how do we know what students are learning and how do we actually measure learning. Um, and in particular, I want to talk about this sort of uh, what we call coding of lab books. So getting these wonderful descriptions from students and looking through for whether they identify the issues and explain them and propose changes and all this other stuff um, is wonderfully fruitful and uh, has shown us lots. But doing it for all of these lab books is tedious. <laughs> and this was a wonderful PhD project, um, but I, wouldn't remac I don't think it's something that instructors can pick up and go and apply to their own courses. And so for broad change, we're going to need more efficient assessment methods for other people to take up the charge and start looking into this. Um, so this goes back to our um, triangle as uh, figuring out whoops, uh, what it is that students are learning and how, how are we going to measure that. So I've been working on uh, what we call the PLIC, the Physics Lab Inventory of Critical Thinking. Uh, the goal of this assessment is to probe these critical thinking measures similar to what we've been doing in the lab book coding, um, but that is going to be efficient to administer and efficient for instructors to grade and score, um, so useful. Uh, to give you a little bit of a taste of what we're working on, so it's a case study of two hypothetical groups of students investigating a model of the period of oscillation of a mass on a spring. Uh, the two groups go through, so the first one is doing repeated trials of two different masses and they compare the K values. Um, the other group measures the period for many masses and makes a linearized plot and eventually actually runs into the mass of the spring, which obviously we don't reveal, we want the students to find it. Um, so the questions are probing how the students taking the test are reasoning about these different experimental methods, this uh, sample data that they collect, and the discrepancies that arise, among other things. Um, so we've been testing it uh, the last little while, and the first conclusion is that student ideas about these in critical thinking are very complex. Um, so trying to come up with a closed response assessment, there's more than uh, 10 common student responses. And I realize I should have included a slide that describes how these things get developed. So we start with um, an idea for an assessment. We create open response questions. We did a bunch of interviews with students to sort of refine them. Um, eventually handed out the open response versions to hundreds of students and have then been trying to use the student responses to come up with sort of multiple choice options. Um, and we're now in the testing the multiple choice options stage. Um, and so, uh, for example, the notion of getting students to compare these two K values that one of the groups comes up with. So these are the K values that we use. Um, so we ask students how distinguishable do you think the two measurements are uh, from a scale of not different at all to very different. Um, and then some of the ideas, so then we ask them what reasoning supports this choice. So something about the difference between the two values, the difference relative to the uncertainty, the size of the uncertainties, the percent difference, the overlap of significant figures, a bunch of other stuff. Um, and this is sort of where students are falling. And this is uh, what's interesting about this, if you think about an N of 360, the most I'm finding in one bin is 75 students. Um, so this is actually, their ideas really are spread all across the spectrum here which is kind of interesting. Um, and when we separate this out by different um, levels of students, so we've done this with advanced students, with intro university students, and community college um, students, and uh, it's, it's kind of crazy. And this is, uh, this is data that we just collected this fall, so we haven't collected posts from them yet. Um, so the idea is the darker color, right, means more students, and so we can see the <laughs> intro uh, students. So this was the closed response assessment. These ones were both the open response version. Um, so the closed response version students' ideas really are all over the place. Uh, fortunately, it's a good sign that the advanced students are a whole lot more localized um, around the notion of difference relative to uncertainties um, with a couple other neat changes coming up. So work in progress, but a little taste of the sorts of things that we're looking at. Um, lots of work still to do. So coming up with how do we graph and represent this information to instructors. Again, work in progress. Um, what does a score look like on this test? So we're collecting responses from expert experimentalists um, and looking at what their ideas are and then trying to score based on how expert-like are the students' responses. Um, and then also trying to produce sort of a factor um, or themes of responses. So uh, moments where students, how often students refer to uncertainty in their responses, do they refer to residuals, um, or are they talking more about surface features 
Um, so if you're interested in using this assessment or taking a look, please let me know, because um, we would like as much input as possible from the community. Okay, and so in the um, last minutes, because I want to save lots of time for discussion, um, going back to this idea of these goals, and I, I sort of made a claim at the beginning that critical thinking sort of covers all of these, and I, I think um, it's sort of clear that you know, we need an understanding of the science, nature of science um, and scientific measurement um, gets embedded in this, the idea of models having approximations and limitations um, that data can reveal with high quality uncertainty is certainly embedded in here. Um, just doing the experiments and making decisions about the experiments is gonna lead us in that, that direction. Um, and obviously, scientific habits of mind related to that as well. Uh, it's a little harder sell to talk about the understanding of scientific concepts in this, but if anything, we're actually expanding um, their scientific understanding. So in the courses we talk about, we do the small angle approximation when we're deriving the period of a pendulum, but here we've actually talked about it physically related to precision and quality of measurement. Um, so it's an area of research that we need to dig into whether it actually does extend or improve students' understanding, but I think it's definitely possible. Um, but the other piece is then to talk about interest and motivation, which leads me to the notion that there's actually more um, to this than what I've presented. And in particular, I did interviews with students at the end of the course at UBC. Um, and at one of the courses in particular, I asked the student from one of the interviews, I just asked her, what did you think the goal of this course was? And she gave me this wonderful quote that I'll read to you. She says, when I'm reading about something or solving physics problems or just reading about physics concepts, the idea of me being a physicist in that sense is very far-fetched. The lab integrates everything so much more and it helps me see myself as a scientist way more than all my other classes. Okay, so in summary, I've talked um, a little bit about this notion of science, physicists taking a scientific approach to studying science education. Um, labs in particular offer an opportunity to teach critical thinking and experimentation skills, and I also suggested some limits to how well they teach physics concepts. Um, deliberate practice with what we call these cycles of comparisons and making decisions improves how students think critically, and measuring it is hard, but we're developing some new tools that will allow efficient evaluation of student critical thinking. Thank you very much for your time.